say. North and south, east and west, it is an age in which so many of us feel voiceless. We feel like our stories are not being heard, our voices are not being heard. So that paradox of feeling voiceless is something that intrigues me. I also think it's not only us human beings, but in a way the nature itself is screaming, like in Edward Munch's painting. Say. So the word I want to talk about is scream. And even though it has unknown origins, we do know that it is related to various European languages, including Middle Dutch and Flemish. And in all these languages, at the heart of the word, there's the element of fear, because scream, originally, its etymology comes from being terrified or terrifying. And I find that connection with fear quite important and interesting. I also believe we live in an age in which, ironically, we were promised, we were told that we would all have an equal voice or a louder voice thanks to digital technologies, the spread of social media. But in reality, what happened is that North and South, East and West, it is an age in which so many of us feel voiceless. We feel like our stories are not being heard. Our voices are not being heard. So that paradox of feeling voiceless is something that intrigues me. I also think it's not only us human beings, but in a way the nature itself is screaming, like in Edward Munch's painting, in the age of climate crisis accelerating, ecological crisis and pandemic. There are so many untold stories to which we need to pay attention. I am equally interested in the things we cannot talk about, the silences within families, especially immigrant families, families that have moved, migrate, migrated from one place to another, families that have experienced displacement. So not only immigrant families, but also families in exile. But then again, not only them, also any family that comes from wounded democracies or lands of partition, divided lands, complex histories. It is interesting to question how much of the past is being talked about under the same roof. And so as a writer, when I take a closer look, I find lots of, lots of inherited pain or inherited trauma. You know, I'm also interested in the ways in which generations can experience conflicts the first generation usually in these situations are the ones who have experienced the biggest hardships and obstacles and challenges or the traumas, but they lack the language to speak about those traumas. And the second generation, especially those that have migrated, are busy belonging in their adopted homelands or countries and therefore they have no desire to talk about the past. They want the future to be a tabula rasa, a clean sheet, you know, a new beginning. But then, interestingly, it is the third generation or the fourth generation in such families, in other words, the youngest, who are keen to dig into the memories and the stories of their ancestors, who are keen to discover their identity, who want to ask questions about what it means like to be in between cultures, and in that regard, you can come across young people with old memories. And that is something that I'm always interested in. I want to read a little passage from my new novel, The Island of Missing Trees, in which there is a teenager called Ada, or Ada in Turkish, which means island. And she too comes from a family of immigrants. Her father is Greek Cypriot and her mother is Turkish Cypriot. And even though she has been named after the island of Cyprus, she has never been there. Because in this family too, there are things that are not easily talked about. So in other words, it's a family of stories, but also silences. And this is the part in which Ada screams in the classroom and someone films her without her knowledge while she is screaming. And then that little video goes viral 
which is of course very embarrassing for, for her. But eventually, when that video goes viral, you realize that many people, especially many young people across the world, are also screaming. You know, I don't think it's an age in which it is easy to be young. So I wanted to explore how does it feel to, you know, to, to be voiceless, to be, to be left out and left behind. And this is the part in which Ada screams in the classroom. She screamed. So unpredicted and forceful and impossibly high-pitched was her voice that the other students fell quiet. Mrs. Walcott, the teacher, stood still, her hands pressed to her chest, the creases around her eyes deepening. In all her years of teaching, she had never seen anything like this. Four seconds passed, eight, ten, twelve. The clock on the wall inched its way forward, painfully slowly. Time warped and leaned into itself like dry, charred timber. Now Mrs. Walcott was by her side, trying to talk to her. Ada could feel her teacher's fingers on her arm and knew the woman was saying something, but she could not make out the words as she kept screaming. Fifteen seconds passed, eighteen, twenty, twenty-three. Her voice was a flying carpet that lifted her up and carried her against her will. She had the sense that she was floating, observing everything from a lamp in the ceiling. Except it didn't feel like she was high above, more like she was outside, a sense of falling out of herself, not part of this moment, nor of this world. She recalled a sermon she had once listened to, maybe in a church, maybe in a mosque, for at different stages of her childhood she had visited both, though not for long. When the soul departs the body, it ascends towards the firmament, and on its way there, it stops to watch all that lies below, unaffected, unmoved, untouched by pain. Was it Bishop Vasilius who said that, or was it Imam Mahmud? Silver icons, beeswax candles, paintings with the, the faces of the saints and apostles, the angel Ga Gabriel, with one wing open and the other folded, a worn copy of the Orthodox Bible, the pages thumbed, the spine strained, silk prayer mats, amber rosaries, a book of hadiths, a weathered volume of Islamic interpretation of dreams, consulted after each dream and each nightmare. Both men had tried to persuade Ada to choose their religion, take their side. It seemed to her more and more, that in the end she had chosen emptiness, nothingness, a weightless shell that still hedged her in, kept her apart from others. Yet, as she went on screaming, in the last hour of the last day of school, she felt something almost transcendental, as if she were not, and had never been, confined to the limits of her body. Thirty seconds passed, an eternity, her voice cracked but persisted. There was something profoundly humiliating, yet equally electrifying, about hearing yourself scream, breaking off, breaking away, uncontrolled, unfettered, without knowing how far it would carry you, this untamed force that rose from inside. It was an animal thing, a wilderness thing. Nothing about her belonged to her previous self in that moment. Above all, her voice. This could have been the high shriek of a hawk, the soul-haunting howl of a wolf, the rasping cry of a red fox at midnight. It could have been any of them, but not the scream of, the, of a 16-year-old schoolgirl. The other students, eyes widened in astonishment and disbelief, stared at Ada, spellbound by this display of insanity. Some of them had cocked their heads to the side as if trying to fathom how such an unsettling shriek could ever have come from so timid a girl. Ada sensed their fear, and for once it felt good not to be the one who was frightened. At the blurred edge of her vision, they all gathered, indistinguishable with their baffled faces and matching gestures, a paper chain of identical bodies, she was no part of this chain. She was no part of anything. In her unbroken loneliness, she was complete, 
Never had she felt so exposed, yet so powerful. Forty seconds passed, and still other Kazanjakis continued to scream, and her rage, if this was indeed rage, propelled itself forward, a fast-burning fuel with no signs of abating. Her skin had turned a mottled scarlet, the base of her throat was scraped raw and throbbing with pain, the veins on her neck pul pulsed with the rush of blood, and her hands remained open in front of her, though by now they grasped nothing. A vision of her mother crossed her mind just then, and for the first time since her death, thinking of her did not bring tears to her eyes. The bell went. Outside the classroom, multiplying down the corridors, hurried footsteps, animated exchanges, excitement, laughter, a brief commotion, the beginning of the Christmas holidays. But inside the classroom, Ada's madness was so captivating a spectacle that no one dared to move. Fifty-two seconds passed, almost but not quite a minute, and her voice gave out, leaving her throat dry and hollow inside like a parched reed. Her shoulders sunk, her knees trembled, and her face began to stir as if waking from a disturbed sleep. She felt quiet. Just as suddenly as she had started, she stopped. What the hell was that? muttered out loud one of the other students, but no one offered an answer. Without looking at anyone, Ada collapsed back onto her chair, breathless and drained of energy, a puppet whose strings had snapped on stage in the middle of a play, all of which her friend Emma Rose would describe later on in exaggerated detail, but for now even Emma Rose was silent. Are you okay? The teacher, her face etched with shock, asked again, only this time Ada heard her. As banks of clouds gathered in the distant sky and the shadow fell on the walls as though from the wings of a giant bird in flight, Ada Kazanjakis closed her eyes. A sound reverberated inside her head, a heavy, steady rhythm, crack, crack, crack. And all she could think of in that instant was that somewhere outside this classroom, far beyond her reach, someone's bones... We're breaking. Say